Welcome to Upthinking Finance, a podcast that offers a unique and discerning view of economics and financial planning. Here is your host, Emerson Fersh. Welcome to another episode of Upthinking Finance. J. Paul Getty once offered this as a formula for success. Rise early, work hard, and strike oil. Now, before I get into today's guest in our interview, um, I want to just, first of all, welcome uh, everybody for joining the podcast and uh, tuning in on the YouTube channel. And especially those of you who are, have joined recently. I know Tom Luongo uh, circulated the interview I did with him uh, last week. And as a result, I've been introduced to many new listeners. Uh, and I wanted to just take the moment to give you an idea of the, the purpose behind this this podcast. I was on a. I run a man, uh, investment management firm called Capital Investment Advisors. I've been in the financial services industry now since 1986, and uh, I was on a call two years ago, right in the middle of uh, the beginning of COVID, actually uh, May of 2020, uh, with a wealth management firm that was giving uh, analysis of what was going on, and and the the expert there was making recommendations that were completely incongruous to. The world we were living in at that time and since, quite honestly. But it just struck me as so odd and out of the flow that uh, it opened my eyes. And from there, I began to start digging and realizing that um, this firm, along with many others, had a, a different agenda than just helping clients and providing objective investment advice. And from there, I learned about the World Economic Forum, the ESG, uh, you know, movement, whatever you want to call it. And so I felt that um, I needed to seek out independent voices, uh, people like Tom Luongo, people like Alex Craner, people like Russell Napier, who've all appeared on this podcast. And um, because of those those interviews, um, that's how many of you have found me. Um, but I want to give you realistic expectations of the purpose. Um, initially, the podcast was an opportunity for me to share these views with my clients. I feel like I have a, a, a stewardship that I've been given, and, and uh, it's it's my responsibility to provide uh, differing and, and genuine views, views that aren't uh, influenced by you know the concerns for future fee revenues. Um, but as the podcast has grown, um, I like I said, want to make sure that those of you who are new realize that I also interview everyday Americans, people who have made the decision to start their own business, um, people who the nonprofit sector, you know, you've had a chance perhaps to listen to Chris Hoke, who runs a prison ministry up in Washington, or my my twin, uh, Pastor Roddy Nichols, who's a who's a, a preacher over in uh, Compton, California. Everybody is touched in different ways by finances. And so while I know that many of you enjoy uh, the economists and the uh, geopolitical analysts, and I will continue to have those types of interviews um, as today's guest is related to the, uh, the investment field, um, I will also bring on, you know, these, these, these less well-known people um, because to me, it's important to give everybody a voice, particularly in, in a world today where I'm sure most of you would agree um, Media and exposure is just so skewed. I feel like it's a bit of a crusade for me to at least make sure I'm giving voice to everybody. Uh, so with that spirit, thank you again. It's it's actually humbling to know that there are people who are taking time out of their lives to to listen to a, a 45-minute or hour-long podcast, and I'm just grateful for that. So today's guest, uh, his name is Chris Pusak. He's got 30 years of experience in the financial services industry. He works for uh, Cushing Asset Management, which is based in Dallas, Texas, as a client portfolio manager. He serves as a liaison uh, between uh, clients and advisors like me for Cushing, who is a um, investment advisor that specializes in traditional alternative energy investments. Um, he, prior to that, uh, Chris worked for a firm in Philadelphia that was uh, managed about twelve billion dollars in assets. Uh, he graduated in 1983 from Penn State University. He was a member of the men's rugby team. Um, he earned his CIMA designation in 1999, which is uh, the curriculum for that is provided by the Wharton School. And currently he lives in Ocean City with his wife of 34 years, and they enjoy a number of things, particularly spending time with their two adult daughters. So it's my pleasure to welcome today Chris Puzak, who comes to us from uh, Cushing Asset Management, and he's currently uh, working out of his home office in New Jersey. Welcome, Chris. Hi, Emerson. Good to be with you today. Thank you. So I thought a good place to start would be to explain to the listeners a little bit more about Cushing so they have an understanding of um, the company. I think the name is pretty well known in the energy sector, but 
for those who maybe aren't as familiar? So our firm, Cushing Asset Management, actually started as a research firm first before we began managing clients' money in 2003. Cushing, Oklahoma is literally the heart of the oil and gas business where all the pipelines converge and then from the, from the wells and then send all the hydrocarbons out into the, the heartland. So it's an apt name for our firm, but the point being we've been doing this for a long time and the focus has mainly been on what we refer to as midstream uh, investments, which are the pipelines and networks of storage and treatment that connect the dots from the producers to the users. Now, at our firm, we felt because we were focusing on the midstream area, it was important for us to develop an expertise upstream for those uh, and, and follow those oil and gas producers as well as downstream. And I'll define those three categories if you'd like in a little greater detail. Please, that would be helpful. Okay. So it's actually rather easy to uh, envision. Um, if you're upstream, you're an oil and or gas producer. That means you own the energy. And if you think about that, that means you have a particular opinion about where the price of that energy should be, okay? Your customer is, or you're a customer of, I should say, a pipeline company or a storage treatment company that handles the oil, natural gas, and natural gas liquids, um, and you get paid a fee regardless of what the commodity price that's flowing through your pipes is priced at. For instance, if oil goes in the front of the pipe at $100 a barrel and comes out at, at my pipe at $50 a barrel, I still get paid the same amount regardless of the price differential when oil went in. And that's a big, that's a big differential, but it's to, to prove a point. And then the downstream are the users. Okay, so upstream, you want high commodity prices. Midstream, you really don't care. And then downstream, as you and I fill up our car and turn the lights on in our homes and offices, and then maybe a chemical company buys raw materials, we want low prices. So there's this sturm and drang of, of a, a, a tug and pull of, um, of pricing where each element of the, the food chain uh, has a different opinion of it. Uh, from an investment standpoint, that makes it a little challenging because a lot of times Wall Street will decide to just say, well, oil's up today, so everything's up today and vice versa. So I would say, A, um, you really got to look under the hood in this space and B, uh, over the years, it's been pretty volatile, but it's uh, paying, it's proving to pay off uh, to be a good place to be, especially the last few years um, from the middle of the pandemic in March of 2020. And I mentioned this to you before, as sort of a maybe get us caught up with a brief history lesson here. I, I know as a kid, I was 10 years old when my dad was driving to the gas station. And I don't remember if it was an odd or an even day. Right. But, you know, I think a lot of us, you know, understand oil is it has a big role. I say oil, energy, a big role in our economy and global economy. And so my my assumption has always been this is tied to um, when the country's currency went off the gold standard. I don't know if that's accurate, but maybe give us sort of just a, a high level snapshot of why oil as a commodity, it, you know, I'm saying oil again, but the energy sector has such a big role as a part it, it, within the economy, sure. if that makes any sense. For many years, oil was a glo is still a global commodity. And for many years, natural gas, which is essentially half of the energy business in the United States, was a local commodity. And we can get deeper into that if you'd like. But as you mentioned, President Nixon um, took United States off the gold standard, which created a lot of difficulty with this global commodity because we as a large user of oil, even back in the 70s, um, would be buying from small countries that uh, made a lot of oil. Um, and so it was inflationary in some aspects, it was deflationary in others. So they came to an agreement um, that oil, that the major oil producers around the world came to an agreement that going forward that the price of oil globally would be priced in dollars. And that led to the term petrodollar, okay? Perfect. It didn't necessarily impact, let's say you were in Japan. Petrodollars didn't matter as much as if you were Saudi Arabia, okay? But essentially when you link something to a particular currency, 
it can be inflationary or deflationary. It, and, and generally speaking, as Americans, we like the dollar to be strong because that's deflationary for us. That means the stuff we buy overseas and import into the United States is cheaper, okay? Um, and vice versa. And in fact, there's an interesting thing going on right now. In fact, nothing is working like the way it should. Um, <laughs> our dollar has been super strong, right. um, which is, is good for deflation, but it's not giving us deflation because as we all know, it's very, we're living in a very inflationary environment. So that's something that w the textbook would tell you is ha should happen and it hasn't been. Um, Russia, as an example, when they convert their um, rubles to, well, they get dollars when they sell their oil, they convert it into rubles. And right when they invaded the Ukraine, the ruble weakened dramatically against the dollar and peaked only a couple of weeks after the initial invasion and then fell again to where it had been trading. Uh, so you'd think that um, that was very bullish for Russia, uh, and it was, but even when the dollar strengthened against the ruble, it's unfortunately for us wanting, thinking that Russia is the bad guy, um, uh, it hasn't impacted them as much because they're selling a lot of oil in the black market now to the um, non-sanctioned, uh, uh, the, the countries that don't follow the sanctions. So uh, it's, it's hard to delve into it because, right, as I said, the economic textbooks tell you one thing, and we're in an environment right now where there's so many other things going on as it relates to the price of oil um, that it's just you, you take every day, one day at a time. That's actually helpful, um, just what you said, because one of the common themes that's coming out of some of the economists and people I'm following now, which are more independent analysts rather than, you know, some of these big wealth firms, um, is this that this whole geopolitical landscape is changing and 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 really a lot of you know it, what is it that's been said that if you're operating with the idea that you're um in just another business cycle you're you're really you know very short-sighted so that that actually adds to what i've been hearing um so another one is opec i mean mm -hmm. you know we all know about it we hear about it these big meetings and they're supposed they have all this influence <laughs> do you mind maybe dissecting that a little bit because it really doesn't make a lot of sense to me other than, you know, every time they decide to increase supplies or decrease supplies, you know, it seems to impact, you know, the prices. Well, for years, uh, Saudi Arabia, which leads OPEC, uh, was the largest oil producer, followed by Russia and then the U.S. And that, that flip flop, pretty much with the advent of uh, hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling, whereas up until... Uh, even, well, let's just say pre-pandemic, the U.S. was the largest oil producer in the world. Now, we're a non-sectarian country. Uh, we sell a lot of goods around the world. Uh, you go to the Middle East and all of a sudden things get a little dicier. Um, one country hates another. Uh, one religion hates another. One subsector of religion hates another. And all these people, with the exception of the Israelis, really... Uh, the Middle Eastern countries, ex-Israel, have significant oil reserves, and so they're all working to maximize their own profits. Hmm. Um, and historically, they've been known to be cheaters, meaning they'll say one thing and do something else. So uh, what they say is not always what they do, and it makes the IEA, the International Energy Agency's job, much more difficult because they're kind of the independent body that the tracks who produces what and where it ends up. So again, a lot of uh, crosswinds in, in this space, um, but generally as a cartel, um, OPEC has been very influential as a group, including Russia, they call it OPEC plus, uh, and Venezuela, another uh, sanctioned country, um, that, um, you know, it, it makes for a very volatile market on a day-to-day -day basis for pricing. It's, it's because the information isn't complete. Uh, there are non-economic factors involved. Um, and so it's been that way for a while too, by the way. It's not just that uh, it's a brand new condition, um, but it's also what generates a lot of interest in the space, generally speaking, because there's a lot of money to be made, but you have to be careful. So tell me your thoughts on this. Um... One of these people I follow is his name's Alex Craner. He's based in Monaco, and he actually worked for an oil company. He got in, uh, pulled into the commodity business because of his 
the owner of the company wanting to stabilize the price of you know the oil as they went forward so he developed this model but he talks about saudi arabia and um the short of it is basically you know they have this this 260 billion barrels you know whenever this was and you know based on all these supposed reserves and they categorize them as contingent and perspective and potential and probable and blah 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 but the the numbers that they show in Saudi Arabia in terms of you know active oil fills and the amount of production they have even that I mean that's kind of a crapshoot because they've been you know drawn down all these years yet the number doesn't seem to change so i mean is that something you you you're kind of aware of because it just seems like you know, you hear these peak oil arguments, and maybe that's kind of the question I'm asking you. You know, how do you really know what's where? Okay, so, so uh, there has always been uh, uh, an argument for peak oil, meaning we're we'll, at some point we will start to run out of it, and our supply under the ground will decline to the point where there will be none, no more. Um, the Saudis generally, and most of the people in the Middle East, because of the geological formations, do conventional drilling which is essentially you put a straw into the ground, down into, into the, 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 uh, the field, and there's a theoretical pool of oil underground and you suck the oil out with the straw. That's conventional drilling, okay? Um, with hydraulic fracturing, it's a little bit different and horizontal drilling. In the US, the techniques are so vastly different, so uh, much more expensive and and you really have to run 100 miles an hour just to stay in place, meaning that when you fracture a well, um, you get the first, you get the most production out of a fractured well in the first two or three years, and then it declines rapidly. And I'll just give you some numbers, for example. Let's say you drill a well, you frack a well, and the first two or three years, you're getting 100 barrels a day out of it. By year three, four, five, it might be 20 barrels a day, but it, it goes to a steady state for a long time. Now, the good news here is that, and you'll recognize these terms, wild catters and dry holes, meaning it was a risky business before this technique was, was developed. Because if you missed, if you were doing conventional drilling and you stuck that straw down looking for that swimming pool of oil and you missed by a foot, you missed. And you didn't know where it was generally. So that was considered a dry hole. With hydraulic fracturing, and this is an amazing um, uh, engineering technique, you, you put the, the drill bit down two miles, okay, 10,000 feet generally. And then you turn it sideways and drill out two miles, okay? But then you can turn it 360 degrees. So you basically sweep that area so you never miss because you are literally hmm. finding the oil within a 360 degree arc. And, and, and that's what made the difference. And it really turned oil drilling into the US into a manufacturing process. But as I mentioned earlier, because of the geology and, and the way the fracked wells work or operate, you have to drill new wells just to keep your production levels steady. Meaning if you wanna produce, if your field produces 100,000 barrels a day and you don't drill any new wells in years three, four, and five, you're, we're gonna be down to 20,000. So you just have to keep drilling and drilling <clears> just <throat> to keep that level at 100,000, let alone go even higher, which is kind of the irony when the uh, current administration is kind of pleading with the energy business, please drill more wells. Well, they are drilling as much as they can, yet there's a little political issue here, and it's because of the posture that um, the administration has taken towards the energy business. Drilling new wells is expensive. It requires a lot of capital up front to get a return on investment over time. In, industry executives, I've, I've heard many of them say this in interviews, are highly skeptical of the current administration's point of view around energy, okay? They, they're talking out of both sides of their mouth and they're worried that, yeah, why don't we write a check for a couple billion dollars, step up the drilling, and then six months later when gasoline prices have come down, problem solved, then the administration pulls the rug out from under us, okay? So trying not to be political here, but those that I'm, I'm re-quoting a number of industry execs that have said that in public. And so there's a little bit of uh, tension there too. Um, now, granted, the oil companies are extremely motivated to drill as much as they can and maximize right. the profit. So, so they're not going to, that's, they're going to be their primary uh, driver anyway. No, that's the reality of it. And, and that's the complication, you know, that it, again, that's the thing, like you said about the, the energy sector, 
um, it draws interest because there's so many different things that influence it, which which kind of leads me to, and you sort of just brought up this whole green movement, you know, ESG, because to me, I, I think what you described makes sense because on one hand, you have this short-term need because of this, this whole political issue with the East, I'll just say, you know, Russia and all these other countries that, as you mentioned earlier, that are, that are seeing the oil flow to them. Um, and then you have this shortage in Europe. You have these, 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 all these environmental things that are in place, which, you know, again, in my brain are all tied to, you know, ultimately have its roots in the world economic forum and this, this whole ESG movement. So on one hand, you've got this short-term problem, but you can see the risk and yeah, you go, you spend all this money and then all of a sudden, you know, well, you're not meeting, you know, environmental standards, whatever that is for the particular moment. So that, but that's, I guess, you know, a, a convoluted question, but the, the, I guess really what it boils down to is I do have clients from time to time who will bring up, you know, well, you know, like in California, right? There, there's this thing, they're going to go to electric vehicles by 2035 or something. I don't know what it is. And, you know, we're not living there anymore. Um, but that would be the question is, how does the, this green movement viewpoint, whatever you want to call it, sure. impact, you know, current energy protocols and, and maybe sort of where you see things headed, if that's a fair question? I think that the, the people that are most fervent in the green environment don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. Um, at Cushing, we, we've been in this business long enough to realize that there is a transition taking place. And in fact, we even have uh, investment strategies that are geared towards clean alternative sources of fuel and energy and things like that, not uh, for today's discussion, but it is happening and we're willing to uh, embrace that. But we're seeing the fallacy or the fault of trying to turn the switch 180 degrees in a short period of time. We're seeing Europe, Western Europe's reliance on um, wind and solar when their natural gas is being cut off by Russia uh, or when the, the, the wind and solar isn't working for them at the time. And um, Germany was denuclearizing, going to 0%. I mean, there's a lot of things that were happening in our opinion way too fast. We've even seen it in our own country, the, the massive winter storm that we had in Texas really messed up the grid. Um, and then California has for, for many summers now suffered from these rolling uh, brownouts because they just can't meet demand uh, with, the, with their current, and, and they are leading, okay? They are leading the charge uh, for alternatives, but globally right now, and so this will highlight in, in my opinion, the importance of traditional fossil fuels only 3% of power generation today is generated from alternative sources, uh, non-carbon fossil fuel related. Mm. Okay. Now, talking about the green movement in a broader sense, if you recall the Democratic primary when there were 18 candidates on stage and every, every one of them said, we're gonna ban fracking. Well, those were just platitudes, unfortunately. Uh, and as Pre President Biden became the nominee, his stance became more nuanced. He said, well, we'll ban fracking on federal, new word, but we'll ban new fracking on federal lands, meaning uh, we're not gonna ban fracking. And even he received some legal pushback on, on that. Now, here's why uh, that's impractical uh, at the very least. And this will cover what you have asked about the importance of oil in, in general. Oil globally is primarily a transportation fuel. Here in New Jersey, in the north, Northeast, there's some housing stock that were built in the 20s, like a house that I grew up in, uh, in the 60s, that used heating oil, okay? But that is not a large portion of use for oil in the US. Um, it's mostly uh, gasoline, diesel fuel, and then, um, um, I'm sorry, uh, gasoline and diesel fuel, and then jet fuel, okay, are the biggest uses of oil. Now, there will be a day where oil will be unimportant to the world, okay? But I say this, and you can see me, I'm not a young man. I don't know that in my lifetime, I will ever see a 737 get off the ground on a battery. <laughs> Technology doesn't exist yet, okay? It probably will, but maybe, who knows? It yeah. Maybe not in my lifetime, okay? So that's the oil side of the business. There, there is an end point there, which is very difficult to pinpoint. Natural gas, on the other hand, is extraordinarily, has a much greater longevity, and here's why. When you drill for natural gas, you get four gases. Um, 
one dry gas, which is methane, which every, most people have heard of the term methane, that's what gets piped to, from the wells to the electric, local electric utility plant and it's converted into electricity. Well, over the last 10 years, the US has reduced its carbon footprint by replacing what was 40%-ish power generation by coal down to 25 and now natural gas, methane, is about 40%-ish power generation in the United States. So there's been a big win there that very few people acknowledge. Now let's talk about the wet gases. These are also mostly terms people will be familiar with. And if, if you allow me to use a personal story, I'll, Please. I'll, I, think, I think it will. At the end of the day today, I will sit down on my front porch and light up a cigar with a lighter that has butane in it. That's a liquid gas, butane. Everybody's heard of it, Bic lighters, you know, very ubiquitous. Later tonight, depending on what's on the menu, I might walk to my back porch and, and fire up my Weber grill, which has a tank of propane in it. <laughs> propane has many uh, residential and industrial uses. Now, the last major wet gas is less common, but very, very important, and that's ethane. So if you look at the picture and in my office and in your office, you can pretty much imagine that anything in our environment at this very moment was made, it is plastic, right. was made from ethane gas. It used to be years ago made from naphtha, which was an oil derivative, but the ethane became so plentiful and they figured out how to make it into plastic that that's now the raw material feedstock for anybody that's in the petrochem business, okay? So think of it this way. Because if, if you ban fracking, okay, because of the, the importance of plastic to the global economy and you banned it, you would send the price of, of all energy into the hypersphere, hypersphere, creating massive inflation and a global depression as if we were living in 1875. I mean, I look at, at my neighbor's car, he's got a Tesla. It's got a plastic dashboard, okay? It's so common in the, United, in the world as an economic component that the people, the 18 candidates just didn't appreciate that. And so I think that, that the life of the natural gas side of the industry is, is so far down the road to predict versus coming up with alternatives that the need for oil, gas, and natural gas liquids is gonna be around for a long time side by side with a, a measured transition to alternatives where it makes sense. It, it's a stupid question, just because I don't know. I mean, is drilling for natural gas the process similar to, um, you know, the oil? At one level it is. Um, I guess technologically uh, it's extraordinarily similar, but um, it depends on where you're drilling. So in the Marcellus Shale, which is uh, Western PA, Ohio, West Virginia, and some other areas there, it's predominantly gas C, okay? In the Permian Basin, uh, which a lot of people have heard about, it's pro predominantly oily. Now, a few years ago, if I was an oil guy and I poked a hole in the ground looking for oil, I'd get my oil, but I'd also get natural gas coming out as well. And I didn't really care, nor did I have a way of capturing it. So I would flare it away. And there, you know, you could see those pictures of satellite pictures of North Dakota there and the they just like, they like the, um, the natural gas to get rid of it um, while they're co collecting the oil. Well, that um, has two problems with it. One, uh, it's not environmentally uh, as, as favorable as you'd think. So uh, technology and economics have gotten on that case and they are capturing that uh, gas coming out of an oil well and repurposing it and selling it. So once again, economics and engineering solve the problem. The other thing is if, you're, if you own that land, your royalties are literally going up in smoke. So um, <laughs> it really depends on where you are at, as to what you get. Just a couple other thoughts. Um, and, and tell me if this is right, but as I've been following the day-to-day, -day, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, I sit down with clients, we're always looking at longer term views, but it's kind of interesting when you look at the different energy sectors, it seems to me natural gas is a lot more volatile. Is that a fair observation? Recently so. In fact, okay. uh, for many years, we had so much of it that natural gas was in, in about a 15-year bear market. I think it was in 2005, the cost per unit, uh, 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 1 million BTUs of natural gas was about 14 $13. And as recently as 
the uh, bottom of the uh, pandemic in March of 2020. It was a buck 80 ish. Right. So, and, 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 and it didn't just collapse overnight. I mean, it, it, it's been in the single digit price. Natural gas has dry methane gas, to be specific, um, has been in the single digits for a good decade or so. Hmm. Yet everybody learned hmm. to survive and thrive under an environment where the commodity was not highly valued. Uh, more recently, um, because coming out of, of the pandemic and then the war in, in Europe um, and the uh, failures of um, energy policy in Europe, the, the price of natural gas has skyrocketed from, as I mentioned, uh, two and a half years ago, you know, just around two dollars. It's, um, it's in the 60s or 70s per million BTUs. Um, landed in Europe. Here, it uh, last time I looked was about nine dollars and change per million BTUs. So that's a huge move up uh, from the bottom. So yes, it has been very volatile and has gotten a lot more expensive due to demand um, globally. Uh, yet for years it was sleepy and quiet and nobody really paid much attention to it, which is mm. kind of ironic. Yeah, I've I've got friends over there, and you know they've been sending me, and I've been seeing these articles with you know energy costs quadrupling, and now they're concerned about small businesses going, mm -hmm. uh, you know they can't afford to keep their doors open. Um, so here's a, a question, and I'm just before as we kind of wind this out, um, you know, gas obviously was peaking just a couple of months ago. I mean, it's been had a good, you know, again, I'm using let's say gas yeah. oil prices have been have gone up really for I think probably a good six seven months up until maybe July right. and then and so one theory I read and this is just I'm asking you you know if you your opinion and as we record this we're right at the end of August of 2022 um there's been this this pullback and I and I think my question is because some say it's just political because we got these midterms coming up and you know high gas prices are one of those things that just stick in people's minds because they're dealing with it you know, potentially a couple times a week when they fill up their car. Um, there's also this thing where well, now you have this recessionary fear that's kicking in, you know. So is it political? Is it economic? Or maybe just sort of a combination of a couple of things? Uh, uh, so let's start at the political nature. Um, uh, it, since summer started, uh, the U.S. has been releasing oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve uh, a lot. I, I don't have the exact numbers with me at my fingertips. Well, and selling some to China too, if I'm not mistaken. Well, yes. And, and so that's not always political. There's an economic component to it. It depends what type of oil you have. If you have high sulfur oil, it can only go certain places. If you have light sweet crude, it can only go so, so certain places. So that is a nice headline, um, <laughs> but it's probably not as inflammatory as you'd think. Um, China's buying an awful lot of oil from Russia right now at a steep discount. That's, that's another thing is, is that Russia is undercutting just so they can get their oil off, off the market. Um, but the economic side, as you pointed out, there's a couple factors at play. One, right now it has been very inflationary, okay? So we know who that hurts the most. It's the people that can afford it the least. Um, right. And so there may be some demand destruction there where instead of taking two trips to the uh, grocery store, they're only making one. Or maybe with the modified work from home, thanks to the pandemic, um, they're opting to uh, stay home more as opposed to go to the office, which you know, has some positive personal benefits, but there are some poor professional benefits and another story right. for another day. So there, there's probably some demand destruction there. Recession fears have also played into it. Um, you know, there's a pretty good chance that Europe, Western Europe is going to be in a, a pretty deep recession. There's debate about whether or not we are actually even in one, even though some people's definitions are such. Um, but at the, end, at the end of the day, the price of oil is only about half of what you and I pay at the pump. And if you allow me to digress a little bit. Please. Oil comes out of the ground priced as a global commodity by the global market. So there's nothing Exxon can really do except work against themselves and accept less money than the oil that they own that they just pulled out of the ground. So that's not a business um, uh, practice that is typical anywhere, really. So Exxon or whomever sells their oil or puts their oil into a, a, 
a truck from the well, the trucking company puts a profit on it to take it to the pipeline. The oil goes into the pipeline. The pipeline company puts a profit on it to cover their costs to take it to a refiner. The refiner refines it into heating oil or jet fuel or gasoline, and they put a profit on it to cover their costs. And then, depending on where the refinery is, they put it back into a pipeline as refined products, and that pipeline puts a profit on it to cover their costs. And then it ends up at a, a local depot, and the trucking companies take they put a pro, they take it to the local gas stations, who puts a profit on it. I'm sorry for sounding redundant, but this is a very important point to make. So by the time it gets to the gas station, and then the federal government puts a gas tax on it, and the state gov many state governments put an additional gas tax on it, you've doubled the price of the oil that came out of the ground by the time it becomes gasoline and goes into your and my car. So that, that's, a, that's an important thing to know versus rhetoric that's coming out of Washington. Are those what are called carry charges? Is that right? Am I getting that right? It really depends. But I mean, it's, look, if you're in business to make a profit, it's just your, it's your gross profit. That's all it is, really. You, you mark something, you, you buy something, you mark it up um, to cover your costs and put a profit on it, and then you move it on. It, 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 whether it's oil or clothing or any other uh, food chain of from raw materials, making a t-shirt to, to selling it at Macy's. So what's the political component of that? Well, it, it's that the, the administration um, vilifies the energy producers, claiming that they have a lot more control over the uh, price at the pump. Right. When in fact there are five, six, seven mm. additional um, business units that are in between that, um, and 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 they are ignored by the the administration's rhetoric. So yeah, it's just the whole process from from it's the whole process from what you said in the beginning from upstream to downstream, mm -hmm. all the costs. Right. I guess the last thing I would ask you, and I'm not asking you to you know for the crystal ball, but I mean from your expertise and experience. Is it, is it fair to maybe ask you for like, you know, based on what you know and what you've seen the next two to three years? I mean, I've got my opinions and I think everybody has an opinion, but from somebody who's really in the middle of it every day, you know, where you think things are headed? Oil first, uh, much more highly economic component than natural gas. Um, as a transportation fuel, it responds specifically to the business cycle. So there will be less demand for oil in the next two to three years if parts, major parts of the world are in recession. Um, the the mm. question mark right now is China. I mean, are they coming out of lockdown? Are they not? Um, you know, will their demand swamp uh, the supply? I mean, those are unknowns at this point because the information we get out of China is suspect uh, at best. Um, but the, um, the World Bank, I believe it was, uh, predicted uh, global GDP growth of somewhere between two and three percent this year. So as it relates to oil, if you think about it at a 30,000 foot level, if we're growing as a globe economically, we're burning more fuel today than we did yesterday. So that would be an upward bias for prices, assuming the, there are no supply disruptions uh, and they could be for many reasons, the supply disruptions. Right. The natural gas side <clears throat> is just a little bit less economically sensitive. Um, it certainly is used in industry and that it's part of the business cycle. But as an example, when you weren't going to your office uh, during the height of COVID, um, the lights weren't on in your office. So your office building needed less power. Well, you spent more time in your home office and probably during the day when you were at your office, the, you didn't have the lights on at your home. So there wasn't as much of a decline in demand for uh, power generation um, due to COVID necessarily. And, and then secondly, um, there's a little bit more inelasticity uh, with power because that's how you heat your home and you cool your home. So that requires personal sacrifice uh, if you want to consume less um, and, and be colder in the winter or hotter in the summer. So that's why um, there's le it's less economically sensitive. Um, the NGL side, the natural gas liquid side, uh, it has very bright future um, for a variety of reasons. Um, the economic cycle would definitely come into play with plastics, okay? Global GDP growth, more plastic manufacturing, less, less. Um, propane, though, on the other hand, um, has a lot of uses in areas where 
even in our own country where let's say Toll Brothers is building a housing development and there's no grid that they can uh, connect to. So a brand new home uh, in the middle of Kansas maybe not connectable to a grid will have a big propane tank in their backyard to use for heating and cooking and things like that. So that demand should also grow. Hmm. Um, butane is primarily an industrial use, um, economically sensitive. Uh, and then the propane uh, as, uh, as itself, um, uh, we, we are sh we, five years ago, we didn't sh really export much propane at all. It's become a big export commodity for us around the world. And then lastly, um, the LNG side of the methane dry gas is so huge um, for a variety of reasons because, A, we're now a, um, a newer supplier to Western Europe. We take our gas from the well, pipe it to the water, freeze it to like negative 150, put it on a floating refrigerator freezer, and then you send it around the world. That's called LNG or liquefied natural gas. That takes a relatively local commodity and makes it global. And so that market will grow because people are realizing they can't rely on Russia. But you know where they, else they, they are using it? One of the first things that uh, President Trump did in his administration was sign an LNG export deal with the country of India. India is a huge country, but they're not that wealthy. And if you think about poor countries in general, there's huge parts of the population that use solid <laughs> fuels to cook and heat their homes, cook in their homes and heat their homes. And that creates health issues. If you're burning coal in your hearth, yeah. you know, in your, in your t house in Bombay, you know, you're going to get sick, okay? So to the extent that our exported propane or LNG can replace those solid fuels for foreign countries that are not as economically developed, that, that has many benefits to it. And, and we will be at the heart of that. So simple, simple mind uh, analysis alert. Basically, if you're if you're you've got restrictions and high costs at this point in time to produce, and yet demand is you know for all these, which is really enlightening because I didn't know any of this stuff, and I'm sure a lot of people don't in terms of breaking down these these you know the natural gas and these components and where it's used, and, and um, it just seems to me that global demand you know right now coupled with a, a, an inability to really expand uh production just means higher prices i mean <laughs> I, I buy it to higher prices yes okay yeah i mean no guarantees but I, I know i have this friend of mine who's talked to me about you know forecasts and there was a number of years ago where everybody was predicting well we'll jump and it didn't and so i know different things have you know kind of run on you know sometimes it's a mind of their own for things we don't foresee but uh anyway any last thoughts, Chris, uh, for people who have exposure to the energy sector without getting specific, but uh, just anything you might offer? I would say it depends on where you're exposed, upstream, midstream, downstream. Um, upstream, you'll have high commodity price sensitivity, um, which based on what I just said with a, a general bias to the upside means it's probably a good area to be in. And uh, these companies, instead of investing in their businesses are rewarding their shareholders with above average uh, dividends. So uh, not a bad place to be. Uh, the midstream sector uh, is extraordinarily strong financially and um, they don't really have uh, commodity price sensitivity and they are gushing amounts of cash. So they're buying back stock and increasing their distributions on a regular basis. That's very shareholder friendly. And then downstream is more of a mixed bag because that probably is where the greatest economic sensitivity is. Uh, up until a couple weeks ago, refiners were making um, money hand over fist, uh, but that's not going to persist. Uh, and again, you know, if you're a petrochem company and making plastic, you want low raw material costs. So um, it's it's probably you got to do more homework in that space than the other two, in my opinion. Listen, I really appreciate your time. I know you're a busy guy. Um, thanks so much for uh, appearing with me today on Up Thinking Finance. Sure. Thank you, Emerson. It's great to be with you today. Emerson Fersh is a registered representative with and securities offered through LPL Financial, member FINRA, SIPC. Advisor services offered through LPL Financial, a registered investment advisor and separate entity from Capital Investment Advisors. The opinions voiced in this podcast are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. 
To determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you, consult the appropriate qualified professional prior to making a decision. The guest speakers and the companies they represent are not affiliated with or endorsed by LPL Financial or Capital Investment Advisors. Individual tax and legal matters should be discussed with your tax or legal expert. Economic forecasts set forth may not develop as predicted and there can be no guarantee that strategies promoted will be successful. All performance referenced is historical and is no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. There is no assurance that the techniques and strategies discussed are suitable for all investors or will yield positive outcomes. The purchase of certain securities may be required to affect some of the strategies. Investing involves risks, including possible loss of principal.